This is a follow-on video about hell and the justice of it. I'm going to just first go to what um, Ben Joyner was talking about here in this verse. And then I'm going to jump around scripture to show a couple of things why I read it the way I do. And then you tell me if you can find any Bible verses to contradict. This part deals with the justice. It's surely just for God to repay. Okay? Now here he's talking about the people, the Thessalonians, who are afflicted by other believers. Okay? And by unbelievers for their belief. It's a long story and all that good stuff. The Greek word there I think is flipsis. Oh, let's see. Yeah. This is, this is the verb that translates into phlipsis, and uh, phlipsis is the noun form, which means tribulation. See, there's two tribulations in the Bible. The first one is church. The second one is the official and original tribulation that was supposed to occur, with church being the bridge between tribulation, you know, the official tribulation in Daniel 9, and it's usually translated afflicted in Greek. Okay, and then he's playing. Paul does word play with affliction here. Okay, he's trying to make the point high. There's two. Um, there's two tribulations. First of all, the undated church insertion because the church is inserted at the point where the tribulation officially for the Jews, the seven-year period, should have begun. We get inserted instead, and so that's the theme that he's using here. Okay, but he's he's now tying to hell, all right? Inflicting punishment on those who do not acknowledge God, okay? Acknowledge, I better show you the Greek here, okay? Do not acknowledge God is a, a technical term, all right? No, acknowledge, recognize, see, okay? this right here it's using oida it has a meaning of no understand perceive admit okay because it comes from the verb for to see all right this is what you know the atheist is complaining about you know seeing seeing god we don't see god so we don't believe in him okay then the word for obey the gospel is hupakuo and hupakuo, which is right here, literally means hupo, which is this part right here, means to stand under, to be under. Akuo means to listen. It comes to mean obey in the sense of you're standing under what you heard. Okay, but it's specifically talking about something you hear that you actually accept. All right? So... The retribution is what Ben Joyner was talking about, hell. Let me show you that in the Greek, because I talked about it, but I didn't show it, because I was on the other computer when I made that video. See, this is usually translated destruction or ruin, okay, and this is Bauer Danker lexicon, idea of a state of destruction that's its first meaning a state of destruction like dresden after the bombing see dresden after the bombing still exists a thing that's destroyed can be rebuilt but it is in a state of destruction this is really important because paul is tying to matthew 25 41 when he writes this that's one reason you know that Matthew is the first gospel and it was already out. Because Thessalonians is one of the earlier books that Paul wrote. Okay? Destruction, ruin, death. This is what Christ was talking about in Matthew 25, 41. Okay? Beware of those who can, who can destroy the soul. It's not talking about the soul no longer exists afterwards. It's bombing like Dresden. Dresden still existed 
after it was bombed in World War II, but it was in shambles, okay? Your soul is in shambles. And the idea is to be saved in your soul, not merely in your body. The penalty of eternal destruction means, and it's not really eternal, this is like you can say everlasting or through the ages. That's the literal meaning of this word here, okay? Eternal is not necessarily eternal when it's in the plural. It means ages. Okay, but it can be. All right, see. Pertaining to a long period of time. A period of time may be without beginning or end. Well, it's not without beginning or end, so eternal doesn't really apply here. It has a beginning, so it isn't eternal in that sense. A period of unending duration. Okay, it can be unending. So you see, when you're looking at this, this is not saying anybody's stuck in hell. It's saying that it will go on forever. That's what Matthew 25, 41 also says. Paul is playing back to Matthew 25, 41 when he talks about these two verses here. He's reminding everybody of what Matthew 25, 41 says. Okay, it's really hard to understand it in translation because the translation we've heard it so many times that you know we just start to fall asleep. With the Bible, you always have to go slow and you really need to look at the Hebrew and Greek. Okay, when he comes to be glorified, that's the second advent among his holy ones. That's talking about Revelation 20. Okay, Revelation hadn't been written yet, but everybody knew the doctrine already. Okay, and to be marveled at that on that day, that's Zechariah 14. Paul's talking back to Zechariah 14 right here. Zechariah 14 is the second advent, the day that is not a day. In other words, all day long it's going to be dark that day, and it suddenly becomes light at night because principle of optics, everybody all over the world will be able to see Christ coming back with us, church, because... <clears throat> Of the distance. See, if a thing is distant and at the right angle, anybody anywhere on the earth can see it. There are certain stars that everybody on earth can see. All right? And he's going to be coming at once at night, and he's going to be coming from so far away, because heaven is so far away, that everybody will be able to see him coming. And that's why it says to be marveled at. All right? On that day among all those who have believed okay because at the time he's coming at the second advent there are believers in jerusalem and all over the world and he's coming to rescue he's coming to end you know the final war okay for our testimony to you was believed in other words among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed in other words what paul's teaching now in at the time he writes thessalonians will still be understood at the time christ actually comes okay and then this is his sort of like closing all right now in blazing fire on those who do not acknowledge and do not obey meaning hear and believe the lord jesus so you obey by hearing and believing. That's also in Mark 1.15. You repent of your disbelief in Christ. You don't repent of your sins concerning sin because they do not believe in me. That's John 16.9. That's the only sin you can commit that sends you to hell. Now the question is, why does it send you to hell? Okay, why is that fair to go to hell because you don't believe? Here's why. We have to go back to Genesis 2-7. This is the reason why you are not evolved. God formed man out of the clay of the ground and blew into his nostrils, and this is plural in the Hebrew, the breath of lives, plural. So man became a living, and it's not being, it's a living soul. Okay. Nefesh. That means a living soul, okay? And the King James translates that rightly. The real you, here's why not believing in Christ is what sends you to hell. You are not evolved. 
The Bible doesn't negate evolution, but it does say that man himself is made directly by God at birth. Same pattern as Genesis 2-7. Your soul was created directly by God. The real you is immaterial. That's why you can know God. Because God can enable you to know him. Because God is immaterial and the real you is immaterial. And he communicates to your soul his existence. Okay? And he personally, individually made you. You do not have any parents except God. I don't have any parents except God. No human being has any progenitors. And no human being has any children. God alone makes you. This is explained by the Bible in many ways. There are 500 verses on it. Okay, it'll take me forever to go through them all. But look up phrases in any kind of English translation you want that say, I formed you, I caused you, I made you. This is why God says that. This is the only reason you're not evolved. You are directly made by God at birth. Your body is a biological house that you walk around in, and that's Psalm 139. It is not alive. It is just an organic machine. And that's what David says in the Hebrew, but the pro-lifers can't read the Bible and there were pro-lifers at the time of translation and they translated it wrongly to hide this fact. I don't know why, but they did. So the pro-lifers missed the whole point. First of all, they can't, most pro-lifers don't believe in evolution. Well, hell, this is the reason why. Because God makes you at birth. That's the only reason why you're not evolved. You don't have any parents. Your body has parents, but you don't have any parents, all right? And you don't have any kids either. God alone makes each human being human, the soul. That's why you're not evolved. That's also why you're guilty before God if you do not believe in him. Now, we can make this argument from a lot of different angles, but let's look at this from the parenting angle. A lot of atheists will sit there and say, well, I'm a good person, I'm moral, I obey the law, la, la, la. I'm good to my parents. Okay, but if God is your parent and you're not listening to him, then you're not being moral vis-a-vis -vis God. You might be moral in every other way toward other human beings, but you're not being moral to your parent. He made you, okay? Now, he's not saying that you go to hell because of however you behave toward other people. In other words, you don't, the phone company isn't going to give you a benefit or reward you because you paid your light bill. Think of God as a phone company. God made you. Whatever you do, okay, for the light company, which is some other human being, doesn't have anything to do with God. So if you're going to make the morality argument, God isn't making that argument, but people do. If you're going to make the morality argument, then you are immoral if you do not believe Christ paid for your sins. This is the claim. This is the juridical angle of the claim. Okay, if you're going to argue justice about, oh, it's not just that, that you know, how can a loving God send his creatures to hell? Okay, if you're going to argue it from a justice angle, the justice is that God's your father. Isaiah 63 is also on that very topic. Okay, but we're just looking at this one. God is your father. God made you directly, nobody else. So if you are going to spit on your father who went to the trouble of paying for your sins, because, you know, basically the God that who calls himself son, he's also God, but he chooses to play the son role. All right. He chooses to pay for sins, adding humanity to himself on the cross. If you don't accept that payment, which is a free gift to you, then how moral are you? That's the juridical argument here. Now you're going to say, well, but how do I have proof God exists? Your proof is that you're a soul. 
thought is not biological. There's no mass, there's no energy to it. Nobody can find it biologically in you. You can find emotions. Emotions are a body function. Emotions are not part of the soul. Emotions are the body's reaction to thoughts in the soul. No one can read thought. They've been trying for centuries to find out where thought is located and how can you tell which thought is what. They can't do that. The most they can do is say that certain parts of the brain react to certain kinds of thought, but just the kinds of thought. They can't read the thought itself. That's your proof. You think, therefore you are immaterial. You think, therefore an immaterial God can communicate to immaterial you by means of thought, and he sends you thought. How do you know it's from him? Well, that's a good question. Okay, but do you understand the juridics? If God exists and he's immaterial, and if you exist and you're immaterial, and he pays for the things you do wrong, because how are you going to measure up to God? All right, and any good that you do is for mankind, not for God. Okay, he's not the light company, he's the phone company. Then anything that you do can't pay him, and he's not asking you to pay him. He's saying, hi, I paid for you. So believe in my son. You do that, that's a moral thing to do because he's your father and he's saying, hi, this is what I want. Now, if you don't want God and you don't want to live with him, then you say, no, I don't want to believe your son paid for my sins. And then you get what? You get hell. And that's telling you the story in John 16, 9. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. That's the proper translation right there. Okay, Greek word there is peri, and it means concerning, about, on the topic of, okay, on behalf of. And then this is the word sin, it's in the singular, because it means the sin nature. Because they don't believe in me. U means the fact. It means a fact up to the very point at which he's talking. So if they have not yet believed in me would be a better translation. Okay? And the reason why you know that, let me get rid of this. The Holy Spirit, he's called the advocate here. Okay, paraclete is the, the, the translation. I mean, well, transliteration. Um, he will convince the world in, regarding sin, righteousness, and condemnation. Concerning sin, the only sin that sends you to hell, because they, they have not yet believed in me. Because of righteousness, because I'm going to the Father and you will no longer see me. In other words, he's going to be on the cross, he's going to be resurrected, and he won't be on earth anymore. Because the, the resurrection is a vindication of his payment. Okay, condemnation because the ruler of this world has been condemned. Okay, that let me get the right translation here. This is the NAB and it's not right. Okay, concerning the world judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. Okay, concerning righteousness. See, concerning sin, because they have not yet believed in me, is a proper translation. Concerning righteousness, because I'm going to get, I'm going to be vindicated. I'm going to the Father after the cross, and you will no longer see me after that, because I'm not going to be on earth anymore. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. See, John is writing after Matthew. Matthew talked about this problem in Matthew 25, verse 41 where he talks about hell. Okay? Go into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. See, now we come full circle. Hell lasts forever. But that doesn't mean everybody in hell has to stay there forever. It's telling you that there are going to be people who will never die. I mean, they'll never repent. That's the word for, for fire. Okay? And see, here's our word Ionion again, which is how I started this audio. Okay, it's translated, it's translated 
eternal here, but it really doesn't mean eternal. It means it keeps on going. There's no end point in view. That's the proper translation of Ionion. Okay, because it has a beginning. Okay, see, it has been prepared. It isn't existing now. It's been prepared. But it doesn't exist yet. Therefore, you can't call it eternal. Okay, uh, eternal means something that didn't have a beginning. So, eternal is not really the right word. Everlasting, that could be. But it's just as it goes on. Everlasting goes, what do you want to call it? Goes on and on and on would be a better translation of this. Fire that goes on and on and on without any reference to its end point. Which has been prepared for who? The devil and his angels. Why? Because they do not believe in him. Satan has no, if the earth is 4.2 billion years old or 11 billion years old or however old it is, that's how old the devil is too. And he doesn't believe even though he sees God every day. Now that's the big point I wanted to say, is that Satan sees God face to face and he still doesn't believe. So when you argue that you have to have physical proof in order to believe, that's not the right kind of proof you need. What you need is direct contact from God. Satan doesn't believe in the, even though he's in direct contact with God. So that tells you how severe a problem this can be about not believing. And that's the scariest thing about this, is that in Luke 16, okay, let me make sure that the, yeah, it's still recording. I have a problem with this thing recording. In Luke 16, the last half of it, right here, the Lord is telling a story about the afterlife, okay? The guy in Luke 16 dies. He goes into Hades, which is the famous name for the underworld, okay? And Hades was physically located such that Paradise, which is where the saved people went until Christ rose. That's Ephesians 4, 8, and 9. That is in paradise. Okay. But in Hades, the guy who didn't believe, here depicted as the rich guy. In Hades, the guy who didn't believe, he sees Abraham and the saved Lazarus. So, so the unsaved see the saved. That's an advertisement to them. Hello, see, you're, you're in the part because you didn't believe in Christ. I want to really stress this. They're dead. They know doggone well that Jesus Christ is real. They know doggone well who God is. They see the saved living in paradise in another compartment that isn't hot. They're close enough to talk to each other, and they're close enough to see each other, except that he's saying, well, I'm, I'm in agony. Give, oh, he's, he's abusing uh, Abraham, okay? Oh, Abraham, I'm so suffering, like it's not his fault. Have mercy on me, send Lazarus, so he can dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Why is he talking to Abraham? Why isn't he talking to God? See, he can see Abraham. He can see David. He can see all the saved people there in paradise. They're not sweating. Okay, so why isn't he talking to God and saying, Okay, I'm sorry, you were right. I didn't believe in you topside. I believe in you now. Why isn't he doing that? Why is he going to Abraham as if Abraham were God? And why is he trying to manipulate Abraham? And oh, Lazarus is going to come and dip his finger in water and cool my tongue. Really? To, he see, see how he's so full of self-righteousness? All I want is a little drop of water. Because I'm in agony in this flame. You see, if he's in so much agony in the flame, then why is he manipulating Abraham? And why isn't he talking to God? See his self-righteousness? 
How much then is there agony in the flame that he can talk? How much agony is there in the flame that he's all full of his own self-righteousness, that he's talking to Abraham rather than God, and he's trying to manipulate Abraham's pity? And then he's all full of himself. Oh, all I want, see his self-righteousness, all I want is a drop of water for my tongue. I'm not asking too much. Well, then he's not in that much agony, honey. People who are so full of self-pity like this, we know them all too well in this world. They manufacture their own pain on purpose to make you feel sorry for them. So that's why Abraham is saying, you had your good things and Lazarus has his bad things. See, Abraham's giving him a sort of flip answer. All right? And by the way, we can't travel. Sound must have traveled pretty well. But it's, you know, nice and cool where Abraham is and not so cool where our, our self-pitying, self-righteous unbeliever is. Okay, you see the mental attitude? Oh, I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. Remember, Jesus Christ is telling this story. It's not an allegory, and it's not a parable, because Abraham is a real person. Lazarus is a real person. And he's saying, send Lazarus to my father's house, then. And he's still trying to be self-righteous. For I have five brothers, and warn them. And what does Abraham say? They have the Moses and the prophets. This is a nickname for the Old Testament. And the guy that's down in Hades still says, No, Abraham, someone goes to them from the dead rather than Moses and the prophets. In other words, the guy that's down in Hades sees full proof of God, still doesn't believe in the Bible. Wants someone, namely Lazarus, Oh, just go back from the dead. See, because he feels so sorry for himself and he's so full of his self-righteousness, he still rejects the Bible. But oh, if Lazarus goes back from the dead, which is what Lazarus, the name Lazarus means, rise from the dead. Okay, it's a real clever play on words. So if Lazarus goes from the dead, they will repent. They won't repent due to the Bible. The Bible's just chopped liver. The Bible's no good. You see, this is the danger of never believing in Christ. You get all full of your self-pity and self-righteousness, and you love shaking your fist at God. Okay, so Abraham rightly said, if they won't listen to the Bible, they won't be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. And of course, the person who rises from the dead is the person who's telling this story, Jesus Christ. You see? And that same Jesus Christ, who was going to rise from the dead, actually went down to where the rich guy was. Oh, please, I hope my, my audio is it still recording. Okay. He's still he he's gonna rise from the dead. Okay, I my my let's hope it'll do it. Jesus Christ actually does rise from the dead, and it's not doing it because I can't do my limits. Okay, I'm gonna have to come back. Uh, pausing now and I'll come back in the next increment because I got to fix the computer.